Let us begin the first session of the day, how the metaverse makes knowledge a human right from Dan Lederska, chairman and CEO of Ian Reality. Please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Seoul. It's my fourth time at this event, and uh, I want to thank the organizers that always uh, welcome myself and my wife uh, to visit this uh, event and to have the opportunity to meet interesting people, network, and exchange exciting ideas. Uh, a lot has happened during those years that I've been visiting here, and yes, we have a new normal. Uh, and it impacts our lives in many ways. My speech today will contain two elements. One of those elements is far and futuristic, and the other one is near and realistic, but I would say still quite exciting. So uh, without further ado, we will embark on this uh, short journey. Um, you know, Sometimes you have ideas and you get these crazy thoughts. I should probably write a book about this. And guess what? Uh, I never thought to publish it. It was about 300 pages. And for my 60th birthday, my wife, she's over there, she did something that I would never do. She published it. <laughs> so there is a book here. And if you're interested in a book, there's actually some copies out there that I'm happy to, to give away. Um, so this book is about, has a bold title. Uh, it's called The Knowledge Metaverse, The Intelligence Explosion, and How We Can Become Superhumans. Actually, my original title is How We Will Become Superhumans, but my co-writer was a bit less uh, ambitious. Nevertheless, I'm not going to read the book. Uh, don't worry. But I will talk about some of these topics in this far and futuristic approach, the first part of my speech. And I'll talk about five elements, to be precise. The first element is called the intelligent explosion. The second one is describing a little bit how our brains work. The third one is the foundation of the knowledge metaverse. What is that? And the last one is the future by 2035 and beyond. Okay, so without further ado, let's go. The first one is pretty easy, uh, the intelligent explosion. So we all know Earth started around 4.3 billion years, something like that. And the first species appeared around 2.8 billion years. Um, Further on, we have to go to two million years ago, where the first Homo habilis, the person, the first primate that used tools. Uh, and then we have to fast forward to around 200,000 years to find Homo sapiens. That's us. And probably just 70,000 years ago, when we all took this long march from Africa, savannas, and ended up in Korea, Sweden, where I am from, and many other locations, uh, United States, etc. So that's a quite a long journey. And if you follow the development of intelligence on Earth, it's a slow, slow process. And it depends on mutations. And, and it's been a little bit fast, I would say, the last 200,000 years, but still uh, not very fast. As a contrast to that, about 80 years ago, we invented something we all have around us, computers, right? And these computers are filling our lives. And about 30 to 40 years ago, we came up with this concept of artificial intelligence. Now, as a contrast, artificial intelligence is not slow. <laughs> it's actually super fast. So you have two types of intelligence that evolved here. One that follows Darwinistic principles, and you want one that shoots straight up like a rocket. Uh, and it's artificial intelligence. The organic life, which is the slow one, uh, is filled with limitations. And I would say the artificial intelligence too, but slowly but surely gets rid of all these limitations. First 
computers were good at chess, dance, at Go. Now I believe um, AlphaFold is uh, folding proteins. And one after the other, and it doesn't take millions of years or even decades, uh, AI is becoming faster, better, and cheaper. Uh, you know, it begs the question, and I'm not the only one asking this question, if this continues, how long does it take until we, as humans, are rendered useless or left behind? Or even to be more controversial, a lot of people say that the whole purpose of our existence is like caterpillars, to give birth to butterflies. Humans being caterpillars, butterflies being AI. That's a pretty depressing view of the future. Don't worry, I'll cheer you up today. I have some good news. I actually don't think we'll be rendered useless. I actually think AI is here to serve us. Very much like a hammer, or a stone, or a mobile phone. We will be standing on the shoulders of these giants, and we will become superhumans. That's the thesis of the book. But before we go there, we need some connection, right? We need to link ourselves to this. So first of all, we need to understand how our brain works. We have a lot of limitations, but also some wonderful capabilities. One of them is size. We can't make it bigger than it is. Another one is an expiration date. We all have limited lives. Um, but I'm even more interested to see how the brain actually works. I have a bottle of wa water here, and I'll use this as an example to explain how the brain works. All of us, I would say, when we look at this bottle, have already a spatial three-dimensional model in our brains about it. We know how it looks. We have actually the brain when actually doesn't see anything. All the brain does is compare it with the spatial model that exists already. So there's some votes that this could be a cylinder. Not a lot of votes there. Some other votes it's a stick, very few votes. And some of the votes in the brain says, no, this is a bottle. And once we identify it's a bottle, we know our spatial model knows a lot of stuff already. It knows, for example, that I can slightly bend it. It knows that it will be cool, even before we touch it, most likely. It knows how we can open it. We have to turn it like this, and we'll say, click. All this already exists. We don't observe it. And the same applies when I found my way here to the third floor, to the fifth session. I have a spatial model, a three-dimensional model in my brain. And that is not just about the space, but also what I will find and what to expect. So we learn these spatial models since we are kids. If I would touch this bottle and it will be hot, and I try to do this and it will crack, my spatial model will be very surprised and I have to adjust the spatial models. What am I getting with all this? I'm getting to the fact that the way we learn is by experience. We call it experiential learning. And we build those models, those 3D models, in our brains. And that's very important because that gives us also a clue how we should learn, how we should train. If I give you here an option, and you're going to learn how to do an emergency landing on uh, Korean airlines in water, and I give you three options. One, read a book. <laughs> Two, watch the YouTube video. Three, go in a flight simulator and land it. Which one would you choose? And I'll repeat. Number three. And uh, why is that? No, what I'm, it's a, I will, that was a rhetorical question. Very simple. If I read a book, I'll have to think, what was it, page 14? Which button do I push first? If I see the movie, I may remember it. If I've done the simulator, I have muscle memory. I don't have to think. I'll just act. And that's the best way to learn, experiential learning. And that's what virtual augmented reality and the metaverse is about. 
to give us knowledge in a faster, in a better, and to help us make decisions. So that's how our brain works. Now, let's go to the third element, the bridge between man and machine. So let's say if the AI goes like this when it comes to intelligence, and we go like this, we better, if you can beat them, join them, right? We should hitch that intelligence ride. The question becomes, how do we do it? Uh, a colleague in uh, Silicon Valley suggests that we should stick wires, make little holes in our brain, and stick 1,000 wires. It's called Neuralink, and the gentleman is uh, Elon Musk. I find that a little bit invasive. I don't know. I don't know about you. How many here will volunteer to do that? Not a single hand? I lay, unless perhaps I'm totally paralyzed and I have a chance to move, that probably will give me a little conviction, but far too intrusive. I do think, however, this technology in 20, 30 years will be non-invasive. So you'll just have a little band around your head and you can actually communicate with the internet and the AI directly. But unfortunately, that's not possible today. So how can we solve it? There is a way. There is a part of your brain that's exposed, that you don't have to drill holes. And that is your eyes and your ears. Those are available for us. So today, I'm going to talk a lot about metaverse in this device that 5.4 billion people have already. So today, it's not as, let's say, immersive as it's going to be thanks to our friends at Apple, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Google, that all are fighting this trillion-dollar war to create glasses that we put on and have that instant ability and access to our brains. So the bridge between man and machine, in my view, will be provided in the near term, and I'm talking the next 10 to 20 years, by the metaverse, by the knowledge metaverse, to be precise, supported by artificial intelligence, um, augmented and virtual reality. So that's the bridge. OK, so now that we have that on the way, let's go to the foundation. Now, today I will show you some things that hopefully and I'm pretty sure a lot of you says, oh my God, I didn't knew that's possible. So every time, and I've been, since I was here last year, to more than 100 countries, and some of them four times. Uh, my wife jokes about it that I live on an aircraft, and she's brave enough to be with me most of the time. Uh, but I feel a bit like an evangelist back in the days. Um, I have to take people through a journey of awareness that this even exists. Most people are aware understanding of what it can do for you, and finally, belief, belief that this actually can make the difference. So I'll try to do that today in my second part of the speech. But for now, uh, to do this knowledge metaverse, we need to help people to do it. I firmly believe knowledge is a human right, and we want to make this available, accessible, and affordable for everybody on the planet. And Korea, you are an evidence of the importance of knowledge. 50 years ago, you were perhaps with Congo fighting to be number one, the poorest country on earth. Now, look at you. I'm so proud of what I see. Ambitious people. Yes, fighting. You are the most fighting people I've met. <laughs> Every time I turn on the TV, there's some, some issue but fighting for the good also, fighting for prosperity. Um, so I think that's, that is important, uh, and knowledge is important. Okay, so last part of my visionary speech. People ask me, okay, Dan, so tell me what's going to happen in the future. If I knew that, I would probably do something else. I don't know. So I have no clue. But you can do some, let's say, uh, some guesses. Some are pretty qualified, and I will try to make uh, five guesses, or four. One is work, work of the future. Second is education. 
Third is space. Fourth is energy. And fifth is health. There were five. So work. We already got a little taste of that, the work of the future. Pandemic helped a lot, us a lot in that context. So what I've seen emerging, even in our company, is what I call the digital nomad. One of my smartest employees lives in Kigali, Rwanda. If someone told me 10 years ago that would be the case, I would not believe it. I thought about Rwanda and genocide, right? <laughs> um, today, you don't have to buy a crappy apartment in Silicon Valley or London to be part of a big Silicon Valley company or even a small one like ours. You can live anywhere. And things like Zoom were the beginning, the very primitive beginning. Things like Metaverse will take it to a level that it's almost indifferent where you sit side by side, other than we can do come pipe for real, <laughs> or actually uh, be in Kigali or Guatemala or Papua New Guinea. So that will be a huge equalizer. And that will make the rich, the, the journey from, rich to, from poor to rich that you took 50 years, that will enable some countries to do it in 10, 20 years, unless they have a lot of corruption and other things. So work will change. You can be anywhere. Um, education. So probably the next Einstein will come from Bangladesh, <laughs> not from Germany. Because brains, if you give them, feed them with the same type of knowledge, are equal. And the biggest population is not any longer in Europe. It's Asia and soon Africa. Nigeria will be soon, uh, give us 50, 60 years, the largest country on Earth. Um, so we need f ways to, I would think, education. Uh, let's say I have a lecture at Stanford. That lecture will be available not just by video, by being there with teleporting myself from Bangladesh and having a special meeting. That will change education. It will be what we call a level playing field for everybody. And I think the cost of education will also be lowered. Space, the third element. Yeah, when I start speaking by space, I'm a space geek, I'm a former, I started my career actually as a rocket scientist. I, I used to build rockets. So I joke, uh, Elon Musk went from soft to hard. He did software and then I went from hard to softy, so I'm a softy now. Uh, but point being that I believe that we will, within our lifetimes, at least younger folks here, a multiplanetary species. And that will change. It's pretty revolutionary. After 3.8 billion years, suddenly we as life are spreading around. That's a good thing, right? Because we only have about 500 million years until the sun absorbs Earth. So we have a little window. Of course, before that, there will be meteorites, calderas, and other things that will kill us. Because I get this question, why do we need to leave Earth? If, if you want to survive as a species, you have to do it. And there's enough power and efforts and money. I love the competition between China and United States and now everybody to get out there. I, that's what we are destined. We are destined for the stars. And I think space is going to be something very real. I also hope space will be a place where we produce dirty things, things that we don't want to have here on Earth, production that uh, pollutes this wonderful Earth. And that brings me to energy. What do I think about energy? Um, hmm. It's going to be nuclear, I hope. Uh, it's going to be... Uh, people, when they say nuclear, they get a little bit worried. No, it's very clean, it's very safe. It's much safer than solar. How many people fell off roofs? No. <laughs> More people fell off roofs installing a solar panel than ever died in a nuclear disaster. Uh, I think also it's going to be, of course, uh, solar-based. Totally change the way. And I think things like Ukraine conflict will fast-track the Europeans and others to find alternatives and accelerate them. Finally, health. I need to think about that. I just uh, got 60 now, and you start to think about health. And ideally, you want to not 
catch something and then get medicine for it. You need to be proactive. And I think there's going to be a true revolution during our or your lifetime in this context. Now, why do I talk and what has this to do in metaverse? Some people wonder by this time. Because all these things that I talked about, all of them, will be facilitated by the knowledge metaverse. It's a matter of how quickly we can absorb this new information, share it, and innovate. Okay? So with that, uh, I will end uh, my first part of the presentation before we go. The second time will be very visual, so fasten your seatbelt because it's going to go fast. But I just want to read one sentence from the end of the book, which you'll get. Um, from students to CEOs, researchers to retirees, the knowledge metaverse could impact every aspect of our lives. It will fuel our curiosity for knowledge and provide new ways to learn and train, whether it's for enjoyment, education, or employment. It will drive us to find intelligent ways to improve our lives in every imaginable facet, opening up new windows within the world as we knew it, or even creating possibilities we never conceived. It might sound cheesy, to say that the knowledge metaverse could make us superhumans, but by using it to its fullest potential, we could easily enhance our capabilities beyond our current human constraints. Maybe a cape isn't that far after all. Marvels like that last one, if I become superhuman. 